We live in a world that is broken. In our world, we face war, famine, pestilence, heartache, heartbreak, hatred, sin, guilt, death, fear. And around us, in our own culture today, we see the downward spiral of our society. The suppression of truth, the multiplication of sin, hardness of heart, the rejection of God, moral and intellectual insanity, and an increase in rebellion against God. The heart of mankind is fully on display. It is broadcast in new and unique ways via this technology that connects us all. The picture is not good. There is nothing in man to give man hope to turn things around. And then, of course, Satan roams the earth devouring, blinding the world to the glory of Christ. Think about the nation of Israel. Like a great limb lopped from a mighty tree is cut off from the promises of God by unbelief. A darkness seems to be giving way to more darkness. And the truth is, there is nothing new under the sun ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3. It has always been this way. But the world will not always be this way. A sea change is coming. The tide will turn, the momentum will shift. And our world, like a freight train right now, running off the broken tracks of a suspension bridge, seems to be plunging into a thousand foot gorge, only accelerating towards inexorable disaster. But things will turn around. The runaway train will be stopped and saved and set right. This morning, we look at a passage in the Bible that marks the turning of the tides, a change of seasons, if you will. The passage we will study together this morning depicts for us the future moment when everything changes. It is the turn of history. Look with me at Revelation chapter 5, and we will read verses 7 to 10. And he, that is Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the lamb standing slain. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Will you pray with me? God, we come to this monumental passage, this future event that we gaze on in your word, that we look to by faith, we will one day see. We pray even this morning as we gather up our hearts around this text that you would be glorified in us. That what begins in worship in the inner circle around your throne and expands to the universe would be seen in our own hearts that we would be worshipers in spirit and in truth, that we as living sacrifices before you would be holy and pleasing. God, do with us as you will, by your word, by your power, for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have noticed we've slowed down, stalled out in Revelation 5. If you're doing the math, you're thinking 22 chapters, one verse a week. When are we going to get to the rest of the Bible? We will accelerate in chapters 6 through 18. We'll go faster than we are here. But this is my favorite section of the Bible. Remember when Peter and James and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, and Peter, the motor mouth, says, it's good for us to be here. 
Can we make some tents? <laughs> Can we stay around a while? Can we just dwell here? I feel that way about this chapter. I just want to stay a while and bask in the glory of Christ. And when I think about preaching this chapter, I, I don't want to leave. <laughs> when we're done with chapter 5, where do we go? Chapter 6. <laughs> I know. Well, when will we ever come back and, and get to, together as a church See chapter 5 of Revelation again. I don't know. When it's over, it's over. We've got to get on to the rest of our Bibles. But the reality is, very soon, we will be back here in Revelation 5. Not via some sermon, but in person. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will very literally be in this scene. Not to grasp it by faith, not to read it on a page, but to worship Christ. We're going to see in this passage three actions in heaven that mark the turn of history. We study it here in this chapter. We will see it then. Look at verse 7. And Jesus came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So simple a statement, so monumental an event. Jesus receives the scroll. This action in heaven marks the turn of history. This scroll, when opened, ushers in the future history of the world. Earth dwellers will be judged for their crimes against heaven. The earth itself will be recovered from the usurpation of Satan and from rebellious mankind. The unlawful tenants will be evicted and the creation will be restored to its potential under the good and right rule of the best of humanity. This is the moment for which creation groans. Romans 8 says that the creation cranes the neck, looking around the corner, longing for this moment. This is the moment for which the saints pray, Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is the moment for which Israel languishes, for now in unbelief, but according to Romans 11.27, one day all Israel shall be saved. This is the moment for which believers hope and wait and sigh and long. This is the moment of the transference of government of the world from bad people to the good king, the king of kings. This is the fulfillment of Daniel 2 when the stone cut out without human hands will arrive on the earth and smash all previous kingdoms, obliterating them at the foot and the base of the statue in Daniel's vision, turning them to powder to be blown as chaff of the wind. All those kingdoms and empires and political powers will be replaced by the righteous reign of peace and goodness, the shalom of Messiah. Notice verse 7, and he came. This depicts movement at the throne. He's not arriving from somewhere else. Remember, we saw last week, he is already at the center of the throne. Here, he simply positions himself to receive the scroll from the hand of the one seated on the throne. And in this scene, he appears now as the lamb standing. We saw he is the only one worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals. This action, Jesus taking the scroll from his Father, will end the rule of Satan. It will bring long due judgment to the world. It will bring a halt to the history of rebellious mankind. It will bring heaven to earth. It will put the curse in reverse. There's a second action in this passage that marks the turn of history. It's found in verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The inner circle worships. You remember the throne is surrounded, the the inner circle of the throne, even supported by those four living beings, is surrounded by the 24 elders. We'll expand the circle out at the end of chapter 5. 
But this inner circle worships. They fall down before the Lamb. This moment, this action sets off doxology and praise, the worship that expands in ever-widening circles like a chain reaction of a nuclear detonation. The concentric circles of song will eventually encompass all of creation. The four living beings and the 24 elders fell down. And they fall down here in this verse before the Lamb, just as they had fallen before God on the throne in chapter 4. This is unmistakable, unabashed worship of Jesus. Listen, only God is to be worshipped. This is a clear statement from Scripture that heaven makes no qualms about Jesus being fully God and fully worthy of worship. If you fast forward to Revelation 19.10 and and chapter 22, verses 8 and 9, there John the Apostle, so amazed at angelic beings that he falls down before them, the angels tell him, John, stop it, get up, worship God only. And yet here those four living beings and those 24 elders and the myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands of angels and the uncountable number of the redeemed from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people surround the Lamb and fall down before Him and worship. This is our God. Notice the 24 elders have musical instruments. Harps. And harps in the Old Testament were used for public worship in song. Play the harp is a command in Psalm 33. They were also at times associated with prophecy. There were prophets who spoke the word of the Lord to the people, and that prophetic utterance was accompanied with harps. And here, perhaps, the fulfillment of prophecy sparks an eruption of instrument and voice in a chorus of praise to the Lamb. Here we have the culmination of the prophetic word and heaven ready to sing. I do not believe there is a scene in all of Scripture to rival this one. Where else do you see the total absorption in the glory of Christ, the attention of all and the voices of all unified around one theme? This outburst of worship marks the moment, the moment still future of the culmination of prophecy and promise, of hope and prayer and the anticipation of the ages. This marks the beginning of the end of sorrow, the beginning of the end of rebellion. Christ is the savior of the cosmos and the universe itself begins to worship him for it. Notice that the 24 elders also have golden bowls. Seems that each has multiple bowls. And these bowls are full of incense and in the original the the word incense is in the plural, incenses. That is, each golden bowl contains a bouquet of aromatic spices of various sorts that are used in the employment of the worship of God. They appear in the temple of God in heaven before God as a pleasing aroma to God. You remember that in the Old Testament, the tabernacle and then the temple were to be built and fashioned after the pattern seen in heaven. There were bowls of incense there that that were the visual representation of the prayers of God's people. In fact, in Luke 1, we read this, the custom of the priestly office, the priest was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense, and the multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. The incense in the temple was a visual picture of the prayers of God's people, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. David prayed this in Psalm 141 too, may my prayer be counted as incense before you. Think about this, Christian. Your prayers in golden bowls in heaven before the throne. All the prayers of all the saints are in heaven. They're not wasted. They've never been a waste of time. They are precious to the Lord. They are preserved in heaven and they are useful. The followers of Jesus Christ in this world may be little in the eyes of the world, despised, rejected, forgotten, unheard. Maybe as a follower of Christ, you, you seek to speak good news and God's glory and his love and his kindness to a world that will not listen. But listen, the mutterings of your heart are heard in heaven And they are precious to God. 
Those prayers are effectual. Think about the hearts of the disciples of Jesus through the millennia that have prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those prayers have worked. Not only are the prayers of the saints stored up as a precious commodity before the Lord, but they are effective. Precious to God as the very means by which God accomplishes His purposes. The longing for things to turn out right, for God's name to be vindicated, for justice to be done, for Christ to be honored, for Christ to be honored in our own hearts and lives and in the world in which we live. God will answer every one of those prayers. Who could count up all the prayers of all the saints from all the eras of history stored up for this moment? And while those prayers appear delayed from our vantage point, they are right on God's time. They will be answered in a flurry and in a fury. They will all terminate in the glory of God and the worship of the Lamb. It will involve salvation of those who believe and the judgment of those who don't. And those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb will enjoy the everlasting presence of God's love and affection and kindness. Will never end. What a contrast is this scene in Revelation 5 to the scene in Matthew 27. Turn there. Matthew 27, we see a tragic preview of Revelation 5 acted out in pathetic mockery of Christ. Look at verse 27 of Matthew 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Here we have a circle around Christ. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and they knelt down before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him. They took the reed and they beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him put his own garments back on, led him away to crucify him. In that scene, in that circle, the king of all kings did not resist. He did not appear there as the lion of Judah, but he went willingly as a lamb to slaughter. He did not open his mouth. And whom those soldiers blasphemously lampooned, the universe will reverence in earnest. Yes, he was mocked, beaten, spat upon, ridiculed. And one day is coming when all the universe will see him for who he is, and he will be worshiped in an endless, expansive chorus. There's a third action in this text that marks the turn of history. Jesus, the Messiah, now holds future history in his hand, and a new song is struck. We see this in verses 9 and 10. The elders, the 24, had fallen down before him. Verse 9, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. They sang a new song. You can read throughout the Bible the new songs that appear. There are commands to sing new songs, Psalm 33, 3. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Psalm 96, 1. Sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing to Yahweh all the earth. 
Psalm 98.1, O sing to Yahweh a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Interestingly, in Isaiah 42.10, a section of the prophet Isaiah where, where God puts out a challenge, who would you compare me to? Go ahead and try to compare me to the, any of the religions, the idols, the false gods of the earth. They are no gods at all. This injunction comes, sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing His praise from the end of the earth. All you islands and far off places and those who dwell in them. Throughout biblical history, new songs were sung with new victories of God's honor, new graces from His throne, and new songs will be sung for victories yet to come. It's appropriate here for the inner circle of heaven to take up this new song. This is the eve of the millennial kingdom, the triumph of Jesus Christ on the earth. They recognize what is about to transpire and they sing. And notice what they sing. Worthy is the lamb to receive the scroll and to open its seals. The theme of this song is the worth of Christ. And he is called here the lamb Again, they are reflecting on Jesus' work on the cross. This is a song of cross and kingdom, of suffering and glory, of death and victory. And notice the stated reason. Worthy is the Lamb to receive the scroll and open its seals for or because. And three statements are made as the ground of Christ's worth, His worthiness to open the scroll. Why was, the slam, uh, why was the slain lamb worthy to open the scroll? You purchased people. You made them royal priests. You were slain. It begins here with the, the slaying of Messiah. Jesus the Christ is worthy to advance God's judgment and redemption plan for the universe because he was crucified. This is what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him, giving a name above all names. Pointing to the cross as the ground of Jesus' worthiness to open the seals. They go on to say, you purchased to God with your blood people. People of out, of out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. To purchase here is to purchase with a price, to pay for something, to acquire a commodity. It was a word used to describe the purchase of a slave out of the slave market. That the price paid for a people for God's glory was nothing other than the blood of Jesus. You remember, Christian, 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price, you are not your own. What is that price? What Jesus himself described in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came to be a ransom for the many. He would be the exchange price for the rescue of sinners. And this people purchased is comprised of individuals from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. This refrain shows up in various orders throughout the book of Revelation. It shows up seven times in the book of Daniel. This is the, the purchase statement of Christ's redemption of his people. The God of the Bible is not some regional deity, not just attached to one ethnicity, one location, one culture. Christianity is not a Middle Eastern religion or an Asian religion, or a North African religion, though those are the geographical origins of Christianity. And certainly Christianity is not a Western religion or some American export. The God of the Bible is the God of every people, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. All will answer to Him. God has purchased people, notice this in the text, out of them all. He purchased for himself people out of the nations and tribes and tongues and peoples. The individuals in view here, purchased by the blood of the Lamb, were redeemed out of the world of rebellious humanity. They were purchased by grace, bought by love. They were redeemed with the infinite price of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. The death of Jesus 
does not wipe away all sins. Do you understand that? It does wipe away all sins for everyone who believes. But there are people who do not believe. There are people who have not submitted to Christ. There are people in this world who do not know God. Those who find themselves on the other side of eternity, not having believed, will find themselves not to have been purchased by the blood. The exchange for sinners was a one-for-one correspondence between their crimes and the punishment due their crimes that Jesus paid for at the cross. What that means is clear in this verse. The ones purchased by His blood were redeemed out of the nations and tribes and tongues and peoples by Jesus. It means they are secure. What Jesus buys, none can steal. What Jesus purchased with his own blood belonged to him. And what follows this scene, what unfolds when Jesus opened the scroll from chapter 6 through 18, is the beginning of the great and terrible day of the Lord, when God will judge the earth for the sins of those not purchased by the blood of Jesus. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't belong to Christ, You need to. You need to surrender and turn your life over to Him. You cannot clean up your life. You cannot be religious enough. You cannot get good enough to make up for your crimes already committed against heaven. But there is one who forgives, who wipes the slate clean because He took all the filth and put it on Himself and paid for it. Every last ounce of dirt. He drank the dregs of the cup of the wrath of his father down to the dregs. So that for those who are in Christ, there is no anger left against your sin. Turn to him. What more could you want in a savior? What more could you want in a king or a friend? Jesus, the King of all kings, calls himself the friend of sinners. He didn't come to save those already cleaned up by their own efforts. He came to save those who recognized their moral bankruptcy, who said, I have nothing to offer, and who cling to his sacrifice on the cross only by faith. You come to Jesus Christ today, and you will avoid the judgment that is to come. You reject Jesus Christ today. There is no guarantee that you will breathe another breath. And you will meet him one day. And if your sins are not forgiven, you will not meet him as friend. You will meet him as judge. Notice verse 9. Those purchased by his blood were purchased for God. Did you see that? Did you notice the God-centeredness of the work of the Lamb? All glory be to God. The salvation of sinners is about God. It is from God and through God and unto God. Jesus, by His blood, purchased a people for God, a people for God's own possession. Rebels against Him are turned to trophies of grace. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the song goes on. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. God's people will be royalty. Kings and queens. A a family of royalty. They will also be a family of priests. The, The priestliness indicating direct access to God. No mediator. Nothing in between. Under Mosaic law, no individual could be both priest and a king. There was a division of powers. But the nation of Israel, as a corporate entity in the Old Testament, was set apart by God as a royal priesthood, Exodus 19.6. Those of us are in Christ are even given those designations. And notice the, the details of this text. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests. That's an interesting statement. 
In that future moment, looking back, the 24 elders sing a song, Jesus has already made the people of God to be a kingdom and priests. They are that already. And then notice the next phrase, and they will reign. That means the kingdom's not here yet, though the citizens of the kingdom already have the status of royal priesthood. The day is coming when God's people will live out these realities. All of this is quite literal. Daniel 7 prophesied this, Daniel 7, 27. At that point, the sovereignty, dominion, and greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. There is a co-regency in this royal family under King Jesus. Matthew 5.5, 5, Jesus promised, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Saved out of the world to rule over it. That is the destiny of believers under Christ. And I want you to notice something very interesting in this scene. Many of the participants of this expanding cacophony of praise are not the redeemed. They are heavenly beings who have never sinned. Those four living beings who surround the throne, the myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands of angels in verses 11 to 14, they have never sinned. They will never sin. They do not know what it is to sin. They also do not know what it is to be forgiven. They've never experienced personally the benefits of the cross work of Christ Having gone from rebellion to subjection, having gone from enemy to friend, they don't know what it's like to be made sons. They don't know what it's like to be under the domain of darkness and then to experience light. They have been saturated for all of their existence, going on some 6,000 years now, in holiness. The separatedness of our holy, holy, holy God. They have dwelt with Him. They have served Him faithfully. They have never erred. They have been acquainted with glory. They know what heaven is like. And heaven knew the second person of the Trinity. Think about that. From creation, heaven knew Christ. They knew what he was like. They knew his glory. They know that the, the radiating brilliance of his being was the sum total of the divine attributes. They know that he's Lord. They have always known. And think about us, earthlings. We've known sin. We've known sorrow, we've known death, we've lived in fear, and then we saw the incarnate Son in His humiliation. We were surprised at the breakthroughs of glory, fish and bread out of nothing, water into wine, a lame man healed, the man with a withered hand stretched it out, Lazarus walking out of his own tomb. We were amazed. None of those things are amazing from heaven's vantage point. What was heaven astounded by? The humiliation of the second person. Heaven's astounded at the cross. What we have in the gospel, Peter says, the, the angels long to look into. They, they scratch their heads at grace and mercy. Think about this. Angels who have never sinned watched other angels who did sin be cast away, never to be redeemed. One and done. Game over. And then for all of human history, angels in heaven watch God in his mercy deal with humanity, image bearers, designed by God to be his co-regents and sub-regents on his earth, messing everything up, and God patient and long-suffering and merciful and then 
gracious. Eat from the fruit of the tree and you'll die. What might the angels have expected next? And God kills animals, innocent animals, to cover their shame. And then a sacrificial system. And then the sun leaves heaven, comes to earth in humiliation. Not just as a man, but as a lowly one. A slave enduring the cross. Angels have been the, the sanctioned, commissioned servants of redeemed sinners, Hebrews 1.14. They are sent out into all the earth to serve those who will inherit salvation. And they've never sinned. And they serve us sinners who are forgiven. Heaven gets glory. They understand it. They don't understand the cross experientially, personally. And we, on the other hand, as earthlings, <laughs> we got astounded at the resurrection of Christ. What? He, he, he rose from the dead? Should have been no surprise if we had known who he was. Much more surprising that he died than that he rose again. We were astounded at his true identity. We were astounded at his true purpose. As the theologian Michael W. Smith said, nobody knew his secret ambition. We see it here. It becomes the ground of his worthiness to open the scroll and to break the seals and to usher in God's judgment and redemptive plan for the world. Think about missions in John's day, you know, the, the expansion of the message about Christ to the ends of the earth. In John's day, the church was small and persecuted. How encouraging would it be for him to be transported into this future event and see surrounding the throne of the Lamb an uncountable number of the redeemed from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Oh, I guess I can put my hand to this missions thing. How encouraging would it be to the faithful through the ages who by feeble hands and weary hearts have sought to win a single soul to Christ. Moms, preaching Christ to the rugrats at home, press on. The throne of the Lamb is surrounded by people who hear the gospel from moms faithful at home. Remember what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul at Corinth? After Paul got beat up from town to town to town to town, he's ready to leave Corinth as well. And, and Jesus says, Paul, stay there a while. I have people there. <laughs> That's encouraging. Paul the Apostle who said, I will endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they can obtain eternal life, was willing to stay in a town he might get beat up in. And probably at Corinth, Paul got beat up emotionally in worse ways than he ever did physically. It's worth it. Omri. Shouldn't have put that in my notes. Go to New Orleans. You and Emily and your team. Back to Papua New Guinea. Jesus has people. The lamb is purchased with his own blood, worshipers for himself. His purchase will not go unredeemed. The blood of Christ is the guarantee of missions. It's the guarantee of evangelism. Revelation 5 is the scene of the signature of that guarantee. You fast forward the history of missions and what do you see? People purchased by the blood of Christ, they're there. 
from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. They're surrounding the throne of the slain lamb and they join their voices to the angels and the heavenly beings. Can you imagine the scene? Sinners saved by grace, recognizing for the first time personally, experientially, what heaven has already known. And heaven seeing sinners joining in the chorus. It will only mean amplification. Deafening songs of praise. Omri and Emily and the team must go. And may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. Massimo and Susanna and Matt Joanna Johnston, go to Italy and may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. The Cans, the Lehmans, the Mitchells, the Twombleys, and we pray many, many more must go to the mountains of Papua New Guinea and give their lives to the long, hard work that must be done if the people of those tribes and languages are to be redeemed out of their darkness. And may the Lamb receive the reward of His suffering. And Grace Bible Church, go. Go to your homes and preach the gospel. To children and parents and siblings. Grace Bible Church, go to your neighbors. Go to your coworkers and your teammates and your teachers and your classmates. Go to ASU. And walk around the campus and talk to anybody that will take a conversation. Go to the neighborhoods and the apartments across the street from us. Tell them there is a Savior who will set things right and who offers forgiveness of sin. You think about the Great Commission and the Great Consummation. Great Commission, Matthew 28, Acts 1-8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, make disciples of all nations. And this great consummation in Revelation 5, every tongue, tribe, nation, and people represented. How do they get there? One way to think of that is Romans 10. Confess with your mouth. Not that you could provide a savior, but that God did. And believe in your heart, not that you could accomplish the cross work and resurrection of Messiah, but that God did. And then go tell people who have never heard. How could they believe if they haven't heard? How can they hear if you don't tell them? How could they tell if we don't send? Beautiful are the feet that go. How do you get from the great commission to the great consummation? Church, be the church. Gather together and be equipped and then scatter. Think about what it means to be in this room, to hear God's word. To see God's word on the wall as you walk out these doors and then to walk out the front doors, you cannot escape a map of the world. Why? So every day when you leave this place, you remember, you step into your commission when you step out of this building. How could we do otherwise when we ponder what Jesus has done for us? Look, put yourself in the verse. Jesus, you purchased me out of the tongues and tribes and peoples and nations for God with your blood. It just has to produce unending gratitude, ceaseless love, obedience of a living sacrifice and uninterrupted praise. Preaching about Christ is temporary. You're thinking, man, this sermon's long. (laughs) Been in Revelation a long time. I hope preaching's temporary. We are going to be there. And if anybody stands up in that day to preach about Christ, just kindly, gently tap them on the shoulder. Say, sit down. (laughs) We're all here. We have him. (laughs) We don't have to talk about him. Evangelism is temporary. Missions is temporary. Faith is temporary. It'll be replaced by sight. Hope is temporary. All of them now, of course, are desperate and urgent. We preach as if all depends on it. We evangelize everything that moves. We take the gospel to the places it is not yet known to the people who have not yet heard. 
We trust God here until we are with him there. And we hope. We cling with anticipation to the promises of God until they are realized. And at long last, the lamb will take the scroll. The tides of history will turn. And with the universe, we'll sing. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time and place where you will have us who believe. Of ourselves, we have no right to your presence. We should not be in your glory and not be destroyed by it. But you in your grace have clothed us with your righteousness and qualified us to be in your presence. And we will sing, Worthy is the Lamb.